Hey, welcome back to Talk Gnosis. It's a podcast. It's about esotericism. It's about Gnosticism. It's about mysticism. It's about whatever I'm interested in this week and how I can tie it into those topics. Uh, we're welcoming back to the show uh, Michael Osborne. Hello, Michael. Uh, really, really happy to, uh, to to have you here. Uh, I've really become a, a fan of your of your work. And uh, we're going to be talking about a, a very uh, fascinating, interesting uh, book that you wrote that's, that's a little bit hard to, to describe. And uh, I think we're going to, I, I think people are going to really get a lot, a, a lot out of our conversation, though. It's going to be a, it's going to be a conversation that uh, is, is as twisting and as turning as, uh, as, as a snake going through its, uh, its burrows in the ground. But we, we're talking about your, your book, the, the Brazen Serpent, Chaos and Order, and working through some of the many uh, interconnected ideas uh, before we we hit record I, I was trying to explain just uh, how the the book flows it's it's like many rivers uh, crossing each other and then running into the ocean so uh, a, a lot of a lot of symbols a lot of ideas and uh, uh, maybe we can just uh, maybe we can just get into it so <laughs> what is this book what inspired it and what did you set out to achieve when you were writing it yeah um big questions and the get-go but hey um okay so for a number of years like everybody i've had competing ideas and thoughts flowing through my mind a bit like the river you mentioned and i wanted to bring a lot of them together and for some time there's been i've had a um a lot of synchronicity in in my life now whatever the root cause of that might be it tended to sort of focus around um, numbers in particular well you know when you have these sorts of experiences because some of them can be really quite sort of either unsettling or or or, or numinous actually sometimes you, you you start to sort of research around around what it could be so um, I, I, I ended up literally reading around an incredibly wide ranging area of people, everyone from William S. Burroughs through to Young. Um, and then, of course, looking for, for numbers and, and everything else within esoterica, but also in, in, in um, orthodox religion, too. And it's quite remarkable um, how prevalent all of this is. So. Yeah. OK. So the the idea really was then to uh, to try and draw all these things together. And in the book itself, I mean, we're talking um, at one point about Pythagoras and then we go on to sacred geometry and 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 all sorts of things. And of course, serpent worship in in ancient Egypt, amongst many other things. Now, the serpent point um came about because for some time I've always been intrigued by that passage in the Gospel of John where Nicodemus who's the sort of archetypal um, aspirant if you like he, he he's well read around theology he knows his stuff doesn't he as a former high priest I, I suspect and things of that nature but he's, he's seeking Christ out in the dead of night well there's a lot of metaphors for that Obviously, there's the ultimate one that he doesn't want to be spotted because he's going to get sort of linked in with with, with uh, uh, the bad things that are about to go down, of which he's fully aware, I'm sure. Um, but also it's a metaphor for the dark night of the soul, isn't it? And we've all been there. We're either in it, been through it, going to go through it, but it's going to happen. And this man Nicodemus is a type, if you like. Well, he approaches Christ and, and of course, you know, the question is um are you are you the messiah the, the the expected one um and jesus goes on to talk about being born again and of course nicodemus is is befuddled by that but the express point made by raised by christ is that just as the norhushtan was raised by moses in the desert or rather the raised brazen serpent was raised in the desert so shall the son of man and that was something that always always puzzled me because the the reference to the the brazen serpent in in um in the old testament is fleeting and yet here we have this 
quite remarkable statement, putting it foremost in Nicodemus's mind. If you don't mind me interrupting for a yeah. sec, uh, what I'll say is is both incidences are, are, are weird, right? And they, I think they grab the imagination because the, the original narrative in Moses, which we'll talk about, it's, it's very st strange and mm -hmm. uh, it's fleeting and then it's gone. And then again, when Jesus brings it up, the, the context is, is kind of bizarre, right? Because he's, as I mean, just to set it, like you're saying, it's the middle of the night, mm -hmm. he's talking about being born again. And then suddenly he's, he's comparing himself to this brazen serpent, this bronze serpent that, that's being put up yep. in a pole. And it's like, what, what's, yeah. what's going on? So I could see how, how that could, I, I think that's sticks in perhaps many people's minds yeah uh, if, if it doesn't become an obsession if it doesn't pop up again i think a lot of people pause for a moment uh with both stories and say wait what <laughs> what's going yeah, on here because you know you know i mean it, it's one thing reading about um serpent mythology in, in other religions but but when when christ identifies himself with a serpent yes. it's something quite different for those of us from from that western tradition so it it is it is enthralling and 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 of course then if you if you think about the other things that get your mind working like this sprawling river or more accurately i think like a delta i think where you've got lots of branches going off something has to bring it all together and so what i chose to do was to focus on that specifically and then to bring in other things and um, and what i found of course in doing this was that the 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 raised brazen serpent the nahushtan is um is a metaphor really for the divine code in nature which is exactly what christ is talking about and nicodemus would have understood that right so he would have been able to put together these these references which may seem strange to us now uh or uh out of context or uh something that is is left for us uh, as a puzzle to to put together and perhaps yeah. perhaps uh and something we can talk about it too later on in the conversation perhaps putting together these puzzles is inherently i, I don't know if i want to say spiritually good for us but inherently seems to be good for our brains for our minds a sort of exercise of of both uh, logic and imagination when we're penetrating and putting together these kinds of things seems to uh, the, be consciousness expanding yeah. in a way. Do you know why that is? It's why? Because, it's because of balance. Hmm. And and the, the, the raised bra brazen serpent is an image, a metaphor of, of balance uh, and, and, and health amongst other things. Yeah. Which, of course, is why you have the staff of Asclepius and the Caduceus and all, the, all those other all those other things. But, hey, you know, um, it, it's a fascinating thing. I've got to ask you, though, mm -hmm. you've read the book. I know you have. Um, so what did you think? I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, it's uh, the as I said, it's, it's it's sort of a difficult book to to talk about because of all of this information of uh, of all these uh, the, these wide links. I, I think sometimes I worry uh, when I do read a read a book like this, right? Like the there's so many connections. It, I'm like, is it uh, uh, like are these connections there? Like are they like actually like they're there, like wired into reality, or is part of it again sort of a, a, an expression? of of meaning making within the human mind or is it a combination of both you know sometimes uh the, and we'll talk about the the gematria the numerology like uh um sometimes with the numerology I, I wonder if we can get like whatever answer we want right but on the other hand you use numerology in in ways that's uh that are that's 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 very rigorous um, mm -hmm. You know, the, the, sometimes you kind of come, uh, 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 come, come to numerology, numerological uh, uh, connections mm -hmm. uh, through a, a few different paths, and I find that very interesting. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, all these things are individual journeys anyway. Yeah. Um, and I think we find our own truths in a lot of things that we we study, and we draw different things out of out of whatever, depending on where we are in life or or in or what culture we're from and amongst other things or religious backgrounds so um for me of course it was very much from a catholic background that i approached these things um but going back to the 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 thing about whether they they they, they exist or not they're real well i think i think the divine code is real because i think this is exactly some exactly something which pythagoras was talking about thousands of years ago 
we know from quantum physics today that there are these um, mathematical foundations which can be very strange, but which theoretically are true. And there's a strong parallel there, isn't there, with some of the ideas in this book about all of that. And of course, that's another theme that I, I, I bring in with Tyler de Chardin, of course, right at the end. Um, and oddly enough, I mean, his ideas about the neurosphere and stuff are actually coming true. Yeah. You know, the, the World Wide Web, that doesn't differ an awful lot from the Akashic Records, does it? No. You know, and it occupies this space. It's not a physical space. This world of ideas and thoughts which live in in, um, in the ether. Yeah, no, it's. I mean, yeah. it's 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 literally it's literally true. It kind of literally came true. His uh, 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 his his ideas and, and his predictions. Um, you know, something I wanted to, to ask you about. You talked about some of the the many thinkers that you draw on in this book. Uh, it really is quite a w wide range, right? We have uh, the thought of Jung to the origins of the dollar sign. But but a source yeah. uh, that you use is uh, Louis Claude de Saint Martin and uh, uh, Pasquale, uh, the, the, the Martinists, the two Martins, and, and often in, in Anglo esoteric writing, like when somebody is, is sort of looking at the Western mm -hmm. mystery tradition or looking to, to draw from some different sources to, to kind of uh, 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 talk about a symbol set, talk about ancient knowledge in, in the way that you are in this book, uh, people don't really seem to look back to these these thinkers, to look back to some of the the, the marginalist systems. Why, why do you think that the thought of these mystics uh, is not as used as much? Why esotericists don't don't draw from them? Is it, is it just simply a, 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 an Anglo-Franco thing? Or, yeah. or do you have any thoughts about that? Well, it's, it's, it's that, but also um, a lot of the access into this is through Freemasonry. And of course, that's very restrictive for many people in many parts of the world anyway, or they, they may not choose to join it for a, for a, a good number of reasons, or even if they do not find them. Okay. So, um, yes, there is the French, uh, English speaking thing. I mean, a, a lot of, uh, the material hasn't been available until comparatively recently. Um, and as I, I've discovered, um, you know, there are, there are other, there are other hunters on the same block as far as coming out with these things are concerned and there's some there's some crossing of paths i'm afraid but um the main thing is that it was occult knowledge it was hidden it was for adepts uh for the most part now i suppose san matan was publishing stuff that people could have read but he couldn't share everything in that work and besides which it wasn't printed in english was it yeah. Uh, and it will be difficult to actually pick up this stuff and run with it from scratch anyway. You need to build, um, you know, so this is important. I think this this idea that we take our time to build, it's our pace, but we take our time to build our knowledge base. And then, and then we can begin to discover and find these things. I always find, I mean, talking about synchronicity, that um, these things find you rather than the other way around, right? Yeah. 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 You know. I, and I think that's a lot of people's uh, experiences and and it can be kind of fun when you when you go back and you you see that 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 crumb of bread trails right uh, sorry that, that crumb of bread trails <laughs> that trail of bread yeah. crumbs that that led you to uh, to some of this stuff and sometimes it's something really small or sometimes it's a phrase or an idea or you see a symbol right like we were talking about in our last interview I, I used to look at some of these these alchemical drawings and just be like, what's, what's going on here? I want to understand what's going on here. Um, and, uh, and, and here we are. Uh, okay, uh, Michael, so we, we did, you shared the Nicodemus narrative with us. Uh, we mentioned the brazen serpent narrative in the Moses story, but we didn't really go through it. So for people who, who aren't familiar with, with this bizarre little story, if you could kind of uh, tell it to us, uh, give us some context. Yeah. And it's a story, I guess, that has, as, uh, many different beginnings really because where do you start do you start with um, Su the Sumerians and the Asherah poles um, the worship of the um, of um, uh, the the sacred snake in Sumerian religion um, or do you look at the later Egyptian influences Arpet for instance and the Uri and things of that nature well you have this Again, I mean, the thing is with the Sumerians, 
the snake symbol was about fertility, fecundity, but also snakes are dangerous as well, you know. Um, and in and in Egypt, you have Apep, who is a tormentor of, of men, and then you have um, the Uri, which is the protector. Um, so there's this duality. And of course, um, the Hebrews, um, I mean, whether or not Moses existed, whether or not um, the Hebrews were slaves that escaped from Egypt. I mean, archaeology um, is um, still ascertaining these things, but it doesn't matter because it's what the story tells you that counts, right? So Moses, um, in, if he existed in all likelihood, grew up within the Egyptian context. Now, when he escaped and found himself in the Sinai, of course, there was this epiphany in front of the burning bush uh, and I refer to that quite a lot because there's a direct parallel between the burning bush and the Nehushtan and that's something again that Jesus is making clear to Nicodemus okay so the casual reader of the Bible wouldn't necessarily draw those links together what happens at the burning bush is that God manifests um, through an angelic being um, um, a bright flame that doesn't burn. This is the, the materia, the substance of divinity. God communicates his voice through this being, this entity, who says to Moses, Moses wanders over to it actually in the narrative. Uh, I guess he's curious. Um, and it, it, it tells him to free the people. Well, of course, I mean, one man going against the, the might of Egypt is a bit like telling you, John, to to go and uh, take on the United States really, isn't it? And bring all the Canadians out. Okay, so Moses says, well, I'm not doing that. He can forget that. And God then invites him, of course, to um, throw his staff, his shepherd's crook on the, on the ground and it transforms into a serpent. But the main thing about it is God then says to him, pick it up. And that's the corresponding part of it. And then it resumes into a staff and with this staff he will bring my people back so he has there um, a magician's stave a, a, an instrument that contains within it this serpent but symbolically of course it's the power of god to retrieve the people and to take on egyptian religion because of course that's what's happening um, he goes to Egypt. This is in the metaphor. This is in a language the Egyptians would understand because for them, um, true, the serpent protects the people. But Apep is a sort of um, almost like a sort of satanic figure that torments them um, after death. It tries to bring them um, away from their reintegration. So we have it so, right. Sorry to travel. So, so yeah. we have it right there in the staff because, of course, the shepherd's staff is is. It's for protection, right? It's it's for guiding the it's for guiding the sheep, but it's also for fighting off attackers. So, yeah. uh, and and a staff is is a protective uh, instrument. Uh, 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 period. And on many it, levels, it turns, on many levels, and it turns yeah. into a snake. So it's uh, yeah. it's like right there, just with this this introduction to this symbol. We already kind of have this this duality, right? But of, what uh, is this staff though, really? Because if it's if it somehow it contains. The, the, the presence of God, which is the implication of the burning bush, God is present and the staff somehow is connected with it. It's like a portable temple that Moses is carrying around, a portable holy of holies, essentially. Um, and of course, there is this competition then between uh, the two forms of, of magic, for want of a better word, and um, God ultimately triumphs and moses is using this staff then to part the red sea okay so this great passage between these two contrasting pillars of water and what happens the egyptians of course are subsumed in it and and, and the, the hebrews survive but they fall away um they're tempted by um the, you know the various demons and within themselves as well as perhaps um within um uh, the, the whole metaphysical structure of what was going on and they have their 40-year wanderings but of course in front of them all the time were these twin pillars of, of um, cloud and fire 
again, the contrast night and day, fire, water, because cloud, of course, is manifestation of vapour, and the staff of Moses. Now, the thing about the two pillars of fire and cloud is that they're really one and the same thing. If you read the, the biblical narrative correctly and carefully, you see actually it, it shifts. So it depends where you are, um, but you have that protection um, in that. Now then, um, it's at the um, um, waters of Meribah incident, of course, where um, a lot of these um, um, things come to a head. So the Hebrews are traversing around the, the borders of the kingdom of Edom itself, perhaps a metaphor for something evil in, in some, in some um, traditions. So that's one point. There they are. And they're grumbling about their lack of food, water and resources. And they're saying to Moses, would have been better off back working for the other guys. If this is freedom, it sucks. I'd rather have slavery, you know, and have food on my plate and, and a job. You know, so this is where they're coming from. And to punish them, God sends fiery serpents. These seraphim, these these um, serpents to strike at the heels of the Hebrews and the the the, the venom is poisonous and they they fall sick and die. And eventually they come to Moses and they say, um, save us from this. We're so sorry. Um, we'll continue wandering around uh, the desert forever. But please make these snakes go away. So they're, they're contrite. They're apologetic. They've reached this point where they, they actually take responsibility for the situation they put themselves in. Right. And then Moses goes to God and says, how do I fix this? And then God says, take your staff raise um, a brazen serpent upon it and anyone who looks upon this shall be healed imminent within of course this brazen serpent and staff this combination of the staff and the serpent a bit like your dollar sign okay is this healing ability people look upon it with faith and then um, uh, the, the um, uh, it with a sense of um of contrition and they're healed and th those that don't aren't um so you know there's a lot in that and there's a lot in the fact that the staff is made of wood um probably acacia wood um which of course is what the ark is made out of as well um and also the fact that the brazen serpent itself is made from bronze so it shines in the dark and it's visible during the day so it's a metaphor as well of the two pillars of fire and cloud in this one thing. And it's healing. Now, it's not the first serpent on a pole that was a healing image. You have the staff of Asclepius and, you, and the, the Canaanites had their Asherah poles and the Sumerians similarly. And of course, the Egyptian pharaohs used to have the Uri on their headdresses to protect and guard people. So there's a lot in it. There's an awful lot in it. And when Christ equates himself with this, essentially what he's saying is the divinity is within me. Um, the, you are in the presence of God and I will be raised as God on this tree. So that's what he's really doing. And he's not identifying with a serpent as such. He's identifying with the raised brazen serpent. Now, there was a tradition in ancient uh, Israel. Um, before Hezekiah came along, because that was one of your other questions about King Hezekiah. He's, he's popped up on the show more than you would think. So. Yeah, I, I'm sure he has, but for different yeah. reasons, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Hezekiah um, um, broke, broke up the Nehushtan because people were going along and they were uh, making sacrifices to it and offering various um, sort of um, 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 uh, offerings that were very expensive and the temple priests were selling it to them making a buck uh, people would go along and they would believe they could be cured by looking at it and everything else and it became a sort of competitor really for the true business of of the religion um, that's one way of looking at it another one is he wanted to melt it down for money to pay off the um the assyrians that had um, been thrashing uh, the israelites in battle yeah. 
the Israelites had backed the wrong side, you see. Egypt had lost to Assyria. So um, Hezekiah, in any event, destroys it and breaks it up. But the memory, the folk memory, the collective memory of this, of this um, icon was very present in the Jewish mind. And they viewed it more positively than he did as a symbol of salvation, hope, of healing, really, and God's protection amongst uh, the, the various difficulties they faced. And again, that's another metaphor for the ministry of Christ. Yeah, yeah we, we've talked about him on the show before because there's uh, a couple different theories about, about he, he was basically making the, the Hebraic religion at the time less mystical. So he was uh, uh, getting rid of the divine feminine. He was getting rid of uh, more mystical aspects of the religion and making it more of a religion uh, uh, based around uh, the royal cult about himself, about top-down authority. So if the if the brazen serpent has all of this this mystical meaning, if it has uh, all of these these very uh, 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 deep uh, uh, meanings, uh, perhaps that could be another reason that he he did want to get rid of it. So yeah, uh, yeah as, as part of this part of this process. Um, well, you mean iconoclasm is a social uh, phenomenon, isn't it? It happens every now and then. Yeah. Yes, it sure does. It seems to be almost uh, something uh, that's very human, almost programmed into humans. Uh, we have our uh, every couple generations, we have an iconoclastic uh, breakout. Yeah. What did you do when you saw one of the kids' sandcastle on the beach? <laughs> yeah. The... <laughs> <laughs> precisely. Precisely. <laughs> so uh, I'm sure some people uh, uh, caught something interesting when you were talking about the, these fiery serpents, which is you called them seraphim. Um, and that, of course, is also the name for for a class of angels. Uh, the, uh, uh, and I'm sure some people are like, well, wait a minute. Isn't that the same word for, for a kind of angel? Or are they just similar words? Or they just sound alike? Or, or did I hear, maybe I heard Michael incorrectly. So can you, can you tell us, and of course, this is part of what this book is all about. This would, this would take the next hour. But if you could tell us a bit well, it about... Would. It <laughs> yeah. would. Why... Uh you know, I mean, about okay. what angels have to do with snakes. Okay, yeah. I mean, the etymology of the word is quite is quite diverse, anyway. Yeah, and it's not always clear if we're talking about the same seraph, seraphim, as you are as other people uh, in other religious contexts. So, I mean, that needs to be to be understood. Um, now, what it comes down to is whether they were physical snakes, because there is a, a, as I mentioned in in the book. A type of snake called the red spitting cobra which um, only comes out at night and only attacks people when they tread on it which might be the origins of the story we just don't know uh, but conversely the, the the fiery serpents are not necessarily necessarily snakes at all there could be supernatural entities that that torment the people doing go either god's work or or the work of the other guy um so this is the this is the the the, the 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 conversation really about that um and of course of the nature of people's relationship with with god the point of it all though is whether it is supernatural or natural is that people had to be brought back and the only way they could be was through suffering and going through the dark night of the soul in order to re-establish a true understanding and relationship with god which was based on mutual love which is what looking upon this raised brazen serpent is okay but they'd have been wandering around for more than 40 years without it i mean this is the other thing so um it needed to be done um the seraph seraphim well you know i mean it are, are they are they a metaphor for god's presence in 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 the world in the material world one of the images one of the many images i put up is pappas's tarot card Oh, it's hard to find the lens properly um, with this. So as you can see, I mean, the idea really was to look at the tower card, not so much as entirely negative, but to actually see it as um, a hope, really, some hope in there that God is present through these difficulties and traumas. It's actually physically or spiritually a part of of us and you'll notice actually i mean even from the image that it's in the shape of a lightning bolt or indeed a serpent which is the whole point and you know what really grabbed my ima uh, imagination i don't know about you was the parallels with north american religions with whom there was no contact 
Yeah, the Aztec. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like the Aztec, Aztec tank mythology. Take for sure. and all that sort of stuff. I mean, this is the thing, you know. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm sure you could go further east and, and have something. I think there are the Nagas in India, aren't there? Yep. yep. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Um, in Tibet. Yeah. Sure. Um, so there's lots in it. Um, and I, I guess, I mean, the thing is, I mean, I do unashamedly approach it as a, a Christian and a Martinist. So this is this is where I'm coming from. But it wasn't originally. It's just something that is, is part of the journey and, and all these ideas are locked in there. But what I wanted to talk about most was the, the synchronicity, the catalyst, really. Um, do you have any particular affinity with numbers at all or, or anything similar? Words, numbers, images? Yeah, I, I think uh, for me, less less numbers, but uh, definitely uh, synchronicities that uh, that pop up for me. I, I, I think it's um, uh, less uh, like I, I know and you kind of discuss it in the book. Uh, I, I mean, you're asking if I have uh, highly personal ones. Right. And uh, we can talk about the number 23. And we can talk about how people have these these personal things that sometimes they 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 pop up for them uh, starting in childhood. Right. They'll see a recurring number, a recurring color, a, re a recurring symbol. So I, I don't really have that. But uh, of course, I've gone through periods in my life where I start to uh, notice things in a very uh, uh, precise and meaningful way. Right, uh, things seem to to pop for me. Seems uh, things seem to be uh, 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 forming a pattern, and, uh, and and of course, Michael, I I always want to keep. Uh, this is partly embarrassment, but partly I, I think for um, and uh, capitulation to the secular world. But for me, it's also important to to stay grounded. Right, uh, one one uh, the, the the head head in the air, but the feet on the ground. So I always do uh, say personally, just for me. I'm, I'm not saying for other people. Uh, I'm always uh, a little bit careful uh, when I'm when I'm hunting for synchronicities, um, or when I start to see them, because is uh, is it is it my mind selecting these things? Does it actually have meaning? Uh, yeah. What's actually going yeah. on? But of course, I would argue at the end of the day that if if I'm noticing these things, uh, it doesn't have to be magical. It doesn't have to be the cosmos shouting out at me for it to have meaning, right? There's a part yeah. of me that wants me to notice these things. Exactly, which takes us back to Jung, of course, and the collective um, un un unconscious, because this idea that we have somehow inherited this um, uh, common mythology, really. Um, and, and that they may well, I mean, the thing about the scientific explanations are, but I do mention in my book, some things are not so easily explainable. And there are plenty of people, of course, who have had similar experiences. William S. Burroughs, for instance, and um, Robert Anson Wilson. I mean, th these are these are these are things that happen. I mean, for me, I mean, I've had the number 23. But the really weird thing is when you when you you go back, you look at documents or photos or memories from years ago long before you were even aware of this and that damn number is cropping up and you didn't re realize it at the time you know so that again is is rather odd um i mean there is a 23 thing uh the number has generally negative connotations and i've always come to the conclusion that somehow it's um it's um uh not a warning, but a sort of like um, an awareness that actually, um, in some ways, the world we live in is, is to a large extent quite purgatorial, that there is this mixture of good and evil, and it, it focuses your attention perhaps to, to step back from the, from the more evil things and to do better things. Um, so with 23, I mean, again, I mean, I mentioned this in, in the book, but I mean, what logic can you make of booking a cinema seat and you walk along, you've got ticket number 12 and 13 or whatever it was, and all of a sudden you've got 11, 10, 11, 12, 23, <laughs> 14, 15, 16, like in an empty movie theatre. You know, so that was the one that you were, you were, you booked, you know, and there it is, you know, or or... Or um, or having a blowout on the road and you 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 on your new car and you've never looked at the spare wheel before and you you open it up and there it is and you lift it out and some bugger's written twenty three underneath it in chalk so it's 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 things like that and one experience more numinous one that I had um, was um, when I was on holiday in South Carolina 
we were staying close to where my father-in-law lives at a friend's house there was nobody else there my wife and i and there was this thumping on the wall it was like a proper thumping we were like someone's in the house you know so we we we, we go into that room there was no one there it was just an empty room an empty house but the the alarm clock in there was flashing 23 23 oh. as we walked in i mean you can't make this stuff up it is not accidental so what's the message what is it telling you um and that was another thing that i wanted to address and actually embrace with this while i was writing it yeah i mean it's not incidental to it it's this idea that um moses staff is a portable temple it's the presence of god locked in matter well you know what numbers have powers too they also have force whether or not it's supernatural john doesn't matter we know numbers do um it's the secret of the atom bomb all the way through to a beautiful building or or a tree growing in your yard it's numbers yeah, I, sometimes I, I kind of think of the some of these ancient Kabbalistic perspectives, right? That reality is made up of letters and numbers, and then you look at sort of modern science, and well, okay, I, I can use mathematics to say that uh, to describe all of reality in a way, right? So is reality made out of numbers? And then some scientists talk about, well, actually, in, in a mysterious way, reality is kind of made out of information. Isn't that kind of similar to what the, the Kabbalists were saying about reality being made out of the alphabet? Uh, I, I find that these are these are interesting comparisons that. Perhaps perhaps can, can illuminate a, a bit. But I, I was wondering for, for people who don't know, and if you can kind of explain, Michael, so, so you mentioned uh, uh, numbers and, and how there, there are sort of power in this material universe, uh, but there's sort of a, a couple different ways to to use them to, to unlock the divine code. So one way, as you mentioned, is just looking for these repeating patterns of numbers, right? Like 23. Um, another way is, is, is kind of uh, um, assigning these meanings to numbers, but also discovering numbers through uh, sort of interesting means, through, through gematria, which is sometimes, hey, there isn't a number here, but there's a way to discover a number and then get more meaning. So I'm, I'm wondering if you can kind of tell us a bit about these, these processes, if you can tell us for people out there who don't know what gematria, gematria, how you say it is if you can well, again, you need an hour for that and, and i think probably <laughs> you be the hebraist which i'm not yeah but i do know that words are obviously a human constructions yeah and indeed the names we give to numbers are and the symbols we give numbers are human constructions um the romans had different symbols to the arabs and and this you know the the vikings are different still and it's one of those things so words are human constructs the images the symbols for numbers are but numbers actually exist and the gematria is saying well you know there is a word made from hebrew um, which um, um, they would argue is the, the language of god you know it's hebrew it, the, the letters are images just as much as they are sounds to make words but there's also a numerical equivalent to them as well that's not the only gematria because the greeks had it and i'm sure there's a latin one too yeah. um and of course numerology um applies um similar uh, principles doesn't it to uh to 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 numbers as well so <clears throat> the idea really is that there's this universal language in numbers it's a bit like close encounters isn't it where they play that tune to encourage this mothership to come over that volcano um it, it's something that is is pretty basic i'm sure if you went anywhere in the world even if you discover the tribe in the amazon and you wanted one fruit right from you wanted to buy one fruit you'd just do that and then understand what you meant right yeah, absolutely. So, um, if there's a code, if God is somehow locked or the spirit spirit is somehow trapped within us um, in the same way that perhaps the synapses of our brain might be eternal mind that is somehow locked in the physical organ for the duration of our lives before it's released, okay? Or, or the world itself it, it somehow contains something of God, then the way to to begin to un unlock that or understand it understand it surely has to be through number um, now number isn't the end it's just the means to try and get to that point okay so in the i mean if you think about the um the the actual figure of the norish you, you have a, a serpent but it represents two things 
and you have the staff which is a piece of wood material thing but it also has innate within it the 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 power of god if you remember the burning bush so it has it already has a sort of numerical um power or or existence of its own just as a symbol and i think symbols have that power they have that ability yeah um I, there's a specific symbol i want to ask you about uh because i want to give some some sort of uh examples that people could really grab onto and kind of fuel their imagination but before we do that i'm just going to quickly do our commercial for our patreon which is patreon.com slash gnostic uh, we need your financial help to do the show you can donate for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month you can put a cap on that too if you're scared we'll do a million pieces of media we usually do uh four to six uh we try to do more uh we haven't uh, lately but we want to we want to pick that up uh and we don't charge for the extras so you help create bonus content for everybody and you get early access to the shows if you uh, help us out that way you can also do one-time donations paypal.me slash gnostic uh and you can help us out by telling people about the show liking sharing subscribing putting it on your social media leaving us good reviews and remember we're out both on youtube and as a podcast uh so uh listen and watch uh in in whatever map fit you like best okay so michael uh something that's kind of fun in the book uh a uh a symbol that you bring up is is the dollar sign can, can yeah, you tell us yeah. can you tell us about about the dollar yeah. sign kind of why this kind of a fun one about, uh, about what it has to do with what we're talking about yeah well i mean I, I sort of dedicate a small chapter to it really don't i um yeah it was pointed out to me it's it's not something i've invented but it's pointed out to me that the dollar um could be interpreted as as um, a, a caduceus symbol well of course i mean the dollar symbol um is the is the is the symbol for you know the most powerful economic empire in human history so if there, if there's some magic or 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 force connected with the the imagery that attracts if you like um, economic success to america through the use of that symbol then that may be one of the reasons it, 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 it's on american currency now the the s could be interpreted as a, a serpent and the, the 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 bar or even the double bar actually even more significantly because as i say the twin pillars um the dollar sign could in fact be um a sort of um pictorial interpretation of of um the Nehushtan, the brazen serpent, or something older still. Um, it's no coincidence that that well, it could be a coincidence, but I don't think it's a coincidence that um, the dollar sign was adopted roughly at the time um, that America was beginning to develop as a powerful independent country, not a collection of breakaway rebel provinces from Great Britain because it didn't appear on the earliest American currency. It was something that seemed to appear around about the 1790s onwards, when, of course, the United States was beginning to um, mould its own identity and um, uh, uh, fiscal independence. So, you know, we I have a bit of fun, like you, like you say, sort of talking about the Bretton Woods Accord and the creation of the State of Israel and, and the... Um, numerological um, theories uh, surrounding that, which, you know, you don't have to accept them, but they're good for reading, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> um, okay, uh, we had to examine that symbol, but coming back to maybe a specific uh, uh, example of, of Gematria that's, uh, that's quite relevant for your book, but can you tell us about how we can kind of connect the serpent and the messiah through through some letters and through some numbers if, if there's sort of a connection right there in in the biblical texts um i can't think of a, a, an example specifically offhand i'm not sure i i necessarily single one out in in the book um but i did um look at the the significance of the number 40 for instance and and it's um and it's various equivalent sort of words that are used in the scriptures. And that's in both the Old and New Testament. 
And um, so you have the 40C and the Mikva Bath and, and the 40 days, uh, or 40 years rather in the wilderness and the 40 days and nights Christ was tempted by um, um, the devil in the desert. And indeed, the uh, the miracle at Cana where the, um, the um, wine vats were filled um, or the water was turned into wine has very strong sort of connotations with the ritual washing of the mikvah and also creation. So the first few words of, of the Bible are mirrored in that miracle. But you have to read it to really get to the, the, the nitty gritty of it. Um, but it's just an example, yeah, again, of this of this um, code, if you like, that's a word, a human word, but this this evidence of God in our in our world, in our in our imperfect world. Um, and then we have to make um, we have to form impressions and form opinions based on this imperfect revelation because it can't be any other, um, can it? Because of the way the way the material world exists. But yeah, so I mean, I do draw on those things, and I, I, I there is an emphasis, I suppose, more on the miracles and the Gospel of John because there were specifically seven of them. You see. Um, and they culminate with the raising of Lazarus. And so you've got that whole um, um, story um, beginning with the, um, the, the, the turning of the water into wine as the creation myth in a, in a miracle, all the way through to resurrection, the resurrection of the dead at the end. Yeah, I mean, every time yeah. I read John, it's a... Uh... Uh, it's constructed, you know, the, the Genesis stuff, right? Uh, the, the way that these these symbols uh, and the, the sevenfold construction keeps coming up in that book in, in many clever ways, right? You yeah. just have this amazing echo chamber okay. of, of, of repeating symbols that's, uh, yeah. that, that can be so dense and so clever. Um, mm -hmm. Well, you know, Michael, we're actually, we're at 46 minutes and I feel like we did a really good job like going through sort of the, the scaffolding of, of this book, of going through the major symbols, of preparing people to actually get to the theology of the book about what all of this means. So we were talking about doing this in two parts. Do we want to maybe, maybe we'll stop now and uh, we'll do the second part and we'll get into what, what the divine code actually is. I, I, I mean, I, I feel like now we've we sort of talked about how we discover the divine code. <laughs> how, how do we unveil it? But uh, maybe we can uh, have a, have another discussion about what the divine code actually is, what it's uh, trying to teach us, what we can learn from it, how we can grow, change, discover knowledge through embra embracing some of these ideas. Yeah, 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 yeah. And in the meantime, yeah, we've got time to order the book. That's right, exactly. So everybody can you can, <laughs> you can read along. You can read yeah. the book and all the uh, color version. Yes, all the color version, which is which is better still because actually um, with those with the color version, um, I actually have incorporated. It's quite again the imagery. It's all about imagery and the effect it has on your feelings. Yeah. Okay, because this is what what actually moves moves people there's nothing else that does but we have the um wenceslaus holler um, um images yeah. um from the um dance macabre throughout the book and they they do help i think as well because it's the sort of book that you can you can pick up and dip into a bit at a time isn't it you don't have to read the whole thing from beginning to end yeah i, and I, I, I would actually maybe maybe recommend that it, it is yeah. kind of a better life. <laughs> like yeah, uh, yeah that, that's no, better way to read the book. Deny it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm really glad too that 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 you mentioned the importance of having the images in there because because again it's sort of a recurring theme on the show. It's already been a recurring theme talking to you. Is is I really think that that imagination, beauty, art, like this is this is what whatever this stuff is is partly all about. And yeah. that when we can awaken the parts of ourselves that love beauty, that love art, that uh, can really appreciate uh, a wonderful painting or a beautiful piece of music, that that's, that, that is um, a spiritual fuel, that that, 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 that is a divinizing thing. Uh, the simple appreciation of art is, is a way of bringing divinity into the world, if you ask me. So I'm really glad that you uh, incorporate that into your, I should say, books, plural. So... Um, 
Okay, so uh, I've been flashing it up on the screen, rosecirclebooks.com uh, slash published books. I'll put that uh, that link in the uh, show notes. But of course, people can also go to Amazon. They can go wherever books are sold online, right, Michael? And then uh, yeah. uh, type in Brazen Serpent Chaos in order, and they can uh, they can get a copy. But we will sure. link it, folks, so you can get it there. Okay, so uh, everybody buy that book. Uh, read it so that you will know what we're talking about next time. Um <laughs> Okay, Michael, we'll be in touch soon, and uh, thanks so much. Thank you for having me. Bye.